I mean, it's a fidget spinner, I know. And it's a good example of angular momentum. So here we are, 24 problems, solving 24 problems to teach you physics, which not really just kind of review physics. I'm using this book, but it doesn't really matter. They're all about the same. So I am on problem number 11. I think that's what it says. Let me put this book down. Problem number 11. Let me go ahead and tell you the problem, and then we'll talk about the physics, and then I'll solve the problem. So the problem is this. The hardest part is finding one problem to solve. There were a bunch of good problems in this chapter, and I picked this one. It says, imagine that we have the Earth, because we have the Earth. Imagine the ice caps melt, which would be bad. And the level of the ocean's water increases by 30 meters. How much does the length of a day change? It's a pretty good question. I like it. Okay, so I have to say a couple things about the polar ice caps. Number one, there's the North Pole and there's the South Pole, which you probably already knew that. Number two, the ice at the North Pole is floating. So if you melt floating ice, it does not increase the level of the water. Now, Antarctica, on the other hand, has a bunch of ice and it's all stacked up and it's on land. If that melts, that's bad. So I don't know the exact amount of uh, level that this would increase, but the problem's at 30 meters. I'm going with 30 meters. Two, number two, you get two things here. Number two, and this is just for fun, it's not in the book. Um, in case you haven't seen this before, we have the Arctic up here at the North Pole, and we have the Antarctica at the South Pole. Those words mean things. They mean bears. Arctic means bears. Antarctic means no bears. Bears, no bears. There's polar bears at the North Pole. There are not polar bears at the South Pole. I mean, you might need that someday. So just that's just a that's just a little bonus for you. Okay. So we're going to solve this problem using chalk, uh, and we're going to talk about angular momentum. So we already talked kind of about angular momentum, but we're going to use uh, better definitions of both torque and angular momentum, and then we'll get the torque angular momentum uh, principle. So before we said, okay, if you have some uh, beam like this and I'm, I'm rotating about some point and I apply a force F and it's a distance R from the center and this is the angle they use phi then we calculate a torque as R F sine phi. It's not wrong, okay? It's just not complete. In fact, we could write torque as a vector. Torque is the vector R cross F. So when we talk about cross products, it's a way to operate two vectors to get a vector result. So some people call it the vector product. Now you can calc the magnitude of that torque as R F sine phi, not surprisingly, but the direction is difficult. So in this case, the direction, one way to find the direction is to take your vector R, take your vector F and put them to start at the same spot. Now, the result of R cross F, the resultant torque, has to be perpendicular to both R and F. Now, there are only two vectors in the entire three-dimensional space that's perpendicular to both R and F, and they are this one, a vector that's coming out of the page, or the board, right? That's perpendicular to both those, and then there's one going into the board. Which one do you pick? This is where the right hand rule comes in. So this is my right hand. So if I take my right hand and I let my fingers of my right hand go through R and then F because the order does matter, my thumb will give me the direction of the vector. So if I do this way, I cross R through F and we can see the torque is in that direction. If I did this, I would cross F and then R and that's not R cross F. So that's how you find it. So torque is a vector. But that means that Angular momentum is also a vector. So if I have a particle right here and it's moving with some momentum, I'll put it like that, and it has a vector position like that, then that particle also has torque. That single particle has torque. I mean, I'm sorry, angular momentum. So the book uses lowercase l, which I'm not a fan of, 
for the angular momentum of a particle, and we calculate that as r cross p. Again, we got that cross product. So in this case, this angular momentum, if r is that way, r cross p would be into the board in the negative z direction using the right-hand rule. I don't like lowercase l because, you know, it looks like a 1. Um, drawing it with script's not so bad, but programming is not so great. Now, if I have a rigid object, we talked about the moment of inertia i as the sum over i m i r i squared. We did that before, right? Or you could integrate. We did that in a problem. In my last problem, the playlist down below. And that's like the rotational mass. So if I have some rigid object and it's rotating about a fixed axis, then we can say it has angular momentum L i omega. And that looks a lot like p equals mv, right? So the angular momentum of a rigid object, capital L, is the moment of inertia angular velocity vector. And for the angular velocity vector, we put our fingers of our right hand again in the direction of rotation, and that tells us the direction. So if this is rotating that way, that would be the direction of the angular momentum vector. I'm going to be honest with you. This is actually not even true. Um, this implies that the angular momentum is in the same direction as the angular velocity, which is only necessarily true if, if it's on a fixed axis. The rotation of rigid objects can get much more complicated, uh, and, and we'll save that for a later course. It's not covered in this course. I'm just letting you know. I'm just telling you the truth. Okay. Now, we have uh, one last thing that I want to mention and that's the angular momentum principle. So remember we have the momentum principle, F net, is uh, the derivative of the momentum with respect to time. And you could write that as mass times the acceleration in many cases. The angular momentum principle says the net torque is equal to the derivative of the angular momentum with respect to time. And you could write that as I alpha also. But this is the angular momentum principle. Okay, I think we're I think we're ready to move on. Yep, let's do it. We can we have enough to solve our problem right here. So let's consider the spinning Earth and spinning Earth with water. Let me say that my system is the Earth plus the water. Now, I looked up, I did this wrong once, and I looked it up, and there's more than one way to do this. So I'm going to do this my way. It even says in there, estimates, I'm doing it my way. You do it another way, and that's fine. Um, but think of our system of the Earth right here. Well, there's no net external torques on the Earth. Um, technically, there could be a force from the, from the sun, um, but if we assume a uniform distributed mass of the Earth, then there's no torque. And the same thing with the forces from the moon. Uniform mass, no, no, no net torque, even though there is a force. Okay, so in that case, I'm going to say torque net is zero, and that's dl dt. And that's the zero vector. So if the derivative of the angular momentum is zero, then L has to be constant. Or I could write this as delta L equals zero. Or I could write that as L1 equals L2, where L1 is the angular momentum before the ice melts, and L2 is after. Now, they're, they're in the same direction, so they have to have the same magnitude. So we can write this as the following scalar equation. I1 omega1 equals I2 omega 2. That's because there's no external torques. So this is the uh, moment of inertia of the earth plus the ice before it melts. That's the angular velocity before it melts. That's after, and that's after. So if the, ang the moment of inertia increases, the angular velocity would decrease and make the day longer. So the day should be a little bit longer. Now the question is how much? Okay, so we have to kind of treat this. I treat, I'm going to treat this as the earth plus water. And so up here, 
I can call I1 is equal to the moment of inertia of the Earth plus the moment of inertia of the ice. Okay, now at the ice, if you remember, I erased it. I is the sum of mi ri squared. So you take all the mass, you multiply it by its distance from the axis squared. And up here uh, at the North Pole and the South Pole, the ice is pretty much right there at the pole. So r is very close to the axis of rotation. And so r is basically zero. And the point is that this, I'm going to say, it's approximation, it's fine. I'm going to say that that's zero because it doesn't really contribute to the moment of inertia because it's right there on the axis. So initially, we just have the moment of inertia of the Earth. We don't have to worry about the water. At the end, I have I2 is also going to be the moment of inertia of the Earth. The Earth didn't change, but plus the moment of inertia of the water. Now, the moment of inertia of the water, it's like a thin shell. So I shell, you can look this up, this is in the last chapter, is 2 thirds m r squared. So this is going to be a radius of the Earth, that's, a, that's the size of the shell, and m is going to be the mass of the water. So the mass of the water, I can say, is equal to the density of water times the volume of water. But the volume of the shell is going to be equal to 4 pi r squared d, where d is the thickness there. So we can basically, we don't have to find the actual volume of a shell because the thickness is so small compared to the size. So it's just like taking the area of the whole Earth and multiplying by d to get the volume. I mean, again, it's an estimate. It's fine. So that's the mass, uh, and that's the radius of the Earth. OK, now you can see, I'm going to do this, these numbers in a little bit, but you can see that we have a problem here. Because the moment of inertia of the Earth is, this is, it's a solid, I'm going to assume it's a uniform solid sphere. Not true. Uh, mass of the Earth, I'm using cap, let's do me r squared. Two-fifths m r squared. But the mass of the Earth is 10 to the 24th, and this is not going to be 10 to the 24th. So the moment of inertia of the shell, this water, is going to be very small compared to that. And if you're not careful, you just get things to round down to zero and there's no changes. So we need to do a little manipulations just to get it in a form that we can deal with it. So let's do that. We're still dealing with this. Okay. And then we're going to plug our numbers and I'm going to use Python to do that. So I have this uh, I Earth times omega 1, right? Because the other one, the, the ice is zero, is equal to I Earth plus I water omega 2. Now, um, I want to find omega 2. So omega 2 is going to be equal to uh, omega 1 I Earth over I Earth plus I water, but I water is really small. And I actually don't even care about that. I want to find the new period. I want to find the length of the period. So omega is 2 pi over t, where t is the period. So t is going to be 2 pi over omega. So I can divide, uh, I, can, I can invert this, and I get the following, and divide by 2 pi. So if I take this, I'm just going to write this as uh, 2 pi over omega 2. And then I have to take 2 pi over this stuff. So it's going to be 2 pi times IE plus IW water over omega 1 I earth. And then this is T2. This is T1. And then I have uh, IE plus I o water over IE. And now I can, I can just write this as T1 times 1 plus I water over I earth. And you see that this, the moment of inertia of the water over the earth, is how much my time, the fraction of a day that my, my earth has to increase by. Right? So if this is one day, then this will tell me how much of a day that is. 
and we can calculate that. So, so now I've, I've, instead of having to calculate all this stuff, I just have to calculate the moment of inertia of the water, the moment of inertia of the Earth. And like I said, let's just put it all up here one more time so we have it and we can type it in there. Uh, I water is two-thirds mass of the water r squared, and then the mass of the water is 4 pi d rho r squared. Rho is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, and d is my depth. So that's my, my volume times my density. I earth is 2 fifths mass of the earth r squared. Let's do it and see how, what kind of damage we can do. Okay, so I'm switching over here to Python because I don't want to do this in a normal calculator. I put some things in here. I have uh, the mass of the earth, I have the radius of the earth, I have the density of water, I have the depth. Um, so, you know, Python's really great for this kind of stuff just because I don't have to punch in a bunch of stuff in my calculator. Um, so let's just go ahead and calculate the mass of the water. The mass, oops, not over here. Mass of the water is going to be equal to 4 times pi times d times rho times r squared. Isn't that right? 4 pi r squared times d times rho. That's right. If you want to print that, we can. We don't really have to, but print mw equals mass of the water mw. And I'll put the units on here, too, just so we can make things look cool. Okay. Wait, that's wrong. Uh, 4 pi r squared. Oh, <laughs> times 10. I have the radius of the Earth wrong. Okay, I knew that was right. So, so 1.5 times 10 to the times 10 to the 19th kilograms, which is huge, but not near the. It's much less than the Earth. Okay, now I can do I uh, water. It's going to be equal to two thirds times mass of the water times R squared. Let's just print that just for fun. Print I W equals I W, and I don't even worry about the units because I can't remember it. Okay, it doesn't really mean anything, but we know it's working. Uh, I Earth is going to be equal to two fifths times m times r squared. Let's print that just for fun. Print I E, which is not Internet Explorer. I E. And see, so you, you see that. The problem here, right, if I try to do any type of addition with these two things, I have 10 to the 37th plus 10 to the 32 is this 10 to the 37th. Okay, so that's the problem. Uh, now up here, I'm just going to calculate, I'm going to call this uh, F day, the fraction of a day that we increase. I'm pointing over here and you can't even see it. So F day is a fraction and it's just the uh, moment of inertia of the water divided by the moment of inertia of the earth. And let's print that F F day equals F day. It's a fraction. So the length of a day is going to increase by this fractional amount. Now, if we want to convert that to seconds, right, that's a day. That's how much of a day it increases by. If I can just change, convert that to seconds. So let's convert that to seconds. Um, let's put dt equals F day, which multiplied by day is 1. And then I just need to multiply it by 24 hours and 3,600 seconds. And let's print it. dt equals dt seconds. And I get uh, 0.36 seconds. That's what I got. Again, you may get other things depending on how you calculate that. So some places I've seen just said, OK, I'm just going to assume the Earth just gets 30 meters higher. Increase the value of R by 30 meters. Um, I don't think that's the best idea because the density of water is much less than the density of the Earth, but whatever. And I would also assume that the mass of the Earth increases, but I kind of did that too because the mass at the poles didn't really change. So there you go. That was kind of a fun one. That's it. Another video coming up.